Hey everyone, so this is another list of directors ranked worst to best, and this time I'm focused on Danny Boyle's films ranked worst to best. For those that don't know, on my channel I've been doing directors from worst to best, their films that is, I should say. Um, I've done like David Fincher's films worst to best, I've done Christopher Nolan's films worst to best, David Lynch. You can find those in the description down below, and um, I do also have a watch list for that. But today I'm focusing on Danny Boyle's films. Now, he's done... 13 theatrical films. Now, I'm not including any plays that he's done or any TV movies. No, no, no. This is, specifically speaking, just theatrical films. And yes, for those of you that are wondering, I am including yesterday, which I didn't see it yesterday, but I did see it a week or so ago. So let's start things off, guys, with number 13. That is Yesterday. This is his latest film. I actually ironically think it's his weakest film. Um, neat touch angles and neat performances aside, I think it's a very ho-hum kind of film that really is only elevated by Danny Boyle's directing. Honestly, if he didn't direct it and he didn't have the style, I probably would give this a 2 out of 5. But alas, I decided to give it a 3 out of 5. Next up, number 12 is... <sighs> Ironically, I believe that this is one of Danny Boyle's father's favorite movies of his, and that's A Life Less Ordinary. I personally, I liked all the mix smashing of different genres, but at the same time, I don't think tonally that it all worked. I think if anything, it just felt very uneven, and it just felt like some ideas were really cool and some weren't, and it was just backed up by Danny Boyle's style. But this was Danny Boyle before he really had that kinetic energy to his filmmaking. And that's why, for me personally, it's it's on the lower end. I really do think that there could have been a lot more potential to this story that could have been more fleshed out, but alas, it wasn't. Next up, number 11. This is one of his kid movies. Actually, it's his only kid movie. Come to think about it. And that's uh, Millions. Millions is the kid movie based on a book, and it's, it's okay. I, I think it kind of has the same problems as yesterday, ironically. It, it's very black and white. It's It's seen as, you know good and bad and there's no gray in the world and I personally I'm not about that which is why for me personally I just kind of felt like Millions was a bit schmaltzy but I do think that this was a film that much in the same way as one of his first films which I'm not going to say because you know it's later on the list but I think Millions follows in the same suit of him gaining his style him finding his momentum and I think although it's not a perfect movie I think if you watch Millions you're kind of like oh He's picking up on his style, and I think that this is someone that can definitely be a potentially good filmmaker, and that person would be right. Um, next up is number 10, and that's based on an Alex Garland novel. Yep, this is before Alex Garland wrote scripts. This was back when he wrote a novel called The Beach, and The Beach was directed by old Danny Boyle. This movie actually got scathing reviews. It has like a 20% of Rotten Tomatoes, but... I have to say, I, I do like the concept. I liked the execution. I think the Caprio was great. But I think towards the end, it does lose its momentum. It does kind of bog down in some cliches. And I think, although I do like the ideas and I do think the messages are kind of cool, I think that's bogged down towards the end. And I do think it's a bit over long at the same time. But I would still recommend The Beach. I would say The Beach is kind of underrated, actually. And that's why it's number 10 and not below that. But there's a film that was better than The Beach, and that was actually uh, Danny Boyle's first film. Number nine is Shallow Grave. This is Danny Boyle Sr.'s favorite movie, and I can understand why, because Shallow Grave, it's it's his first movie, and you can definitely see all the potential with Danny Boyle's directing style, because it's a small little film. It's an indie film, but it has all these ambitious ideas that are matched by the ambitious directing, and although it's an imperfect movie, I think that all the ideas and the directing were there. I just think there could have been a little bit more depth to the movie and it could have been a fully realized vision, but it's still, in my opinion, a really rock solid first directorial film. I mean, heck, he did a better job than what most directors would have done. I think he did a good job with the movie. I liked it. And again, it started the Ewan McGregor, Danny Boyle kind of workmanship, and I liked it. But number eight was a film that I thought was better, and that was T2, Transpotting. This was a good sequel, I thought. This was a film that shouldn't have worked, but I think it did a good job of callbacks to the original that didn't feel forced and kind of made sense. Like, in the first Transpotting, you have Ewan McGregor running in the very beginning of the movie, just like running. And in the second one, you have him running on a treadmill, and I was like, 
I like that because not only does it show a little nuance to how different his lifestyle is in 20 years, but it also kind of shows that he's gotten older and that he can't really run as well because, I mean, you know, as most people know, as you get older, if you start running and not on a treadmill, it does do a number to your joints. I mean, uneven ground does that to everyone, but specifically older people. But off the bat of that rant, T2 Transponding, it's a good sequel. Um, not a perfect movie, but I think a good sequel. I do kind of want to revisit it when I watch Transponding again, but... We'll see how that goes. But anyways, um, let's get to number seven. This is where I start bringing out the Blu-rays. Number seven is 127 Hours. This is with James Franco. This was a good movie. Um, this was a film that really does show, like, existentialism, um, you know, loneliness, and how, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing. I mean, heck, if he wasn't alone, he probably wouldn't have had to, uh, his arm. But this is still, this was, this is a prime example of Danny Boyle's style. I mean, his style with this movie makes this a thousand times better than any other biopic. James Franco also helps, and the score is also very, like, off-putting in a great way. And it also has that famous scene of... But Danny Boyle's directing this is excellent. I can easily see why this got nominated for Best Picture, because it's truly a really, really well-made movie. Um, definitely rewatchability value, too. There's one scene in particular, though, where it's very hard to watch. But, my goodness, it's done very well. So, that's my number seven. The film before that, that he did, is actually my number six choice, and that is Slumdog Millionaire. Oh, yes, the feel-good movie of the year. It is very black and white in ways, but it also shows things in life that I feel as though don't get touched upon too often. Like, yeah, you could argue that this is Rocky in India, but at the same time, I don't think it would do enough credit to this movie because, first of all, this is a lot better filmmaking than Rocky. Just throwing it out there. On top of that, it's done with so much heart and just... The ability of Danny Boyle's directing is just out of this world. I loved it. I also loved how he showed that Dutch angles can be utilized very well. I know I mentioned in yesterday how he used Dutch angles, but before this, I feel like Battlefield Earth was like, oh yeah, that's the one that does Dutch angles. And, you know, because of that, it's a bad movie. But this is the film that for me kind of showed, you know what? Dutch angles, when done properly, they're actually not bad. And of course, this won Best Picture. And although you can watch my review on Slumdog Millionaire, although I don't think it necessarily should have won Best Picture, I do think it's a great movie. And that's why it's number six for me. Number five is going to be a controversial pick because I feel like a lot of people are going to say, why wasn't this slower on the list? But for me personally, I really, really dug this movie. I loved it, actually. And that's Aaron Sorkin's film that he wrote and Danny Boyle directed, Steve Jobs. That's right, everyone. I really dug this movie. I think it's an incredibly well-acted movie, an incredibly well-written movie. It flies by, and I really liked the nuances with the cinematography. No Dutch angles, really, but what he does with the cinematography is that he has this film broken into three acts, per most movies, but each act focuses on different lenses and different um, material, such as the first act, I believe it was shot in 15mm, the second was, I think, 35mm, and then the third act, I believe, was shot digitally. And I think that's a really cool nuance that most people won't really net recognize. But for those that do, it's like, oh, wow, there's a lot of attention to detail in this movie. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like it. It doesn't have a lot of heart to it, but I'm fine with that because for me, this is like Birdman meets The Social Network. And I absolutely love both movies, which is why it's number five for me. I think Steve Jobs is a great movie. Number four is the movie that, honestly, I'm, I'm just going to be real with you right now. I hadn't heard of this movie. I heard of the score, the famous... Um, uh, Adiago in Six, I think it's called. And that's Sunshine. Sunshine is a great movie. I think the score is out of this world. Huh, get its outer space. But I think the score is what brought me to this movie. But the story and the diverse cast and the final act, they're all what brought me to fully love this movie. Because I literally watched this movie just because of the score. And it turns out, after watching it, it turns out it's one of my favorite Danny Boyle movies. The style, the blockbuster action, everything works in this film, and it doesn't end the way you think it will. It, it really is kind of a, I'm not going to spoil it, but it's very different. I liked it, and that's why Sunshine, for me, it's number four. Number three, uh, I don't know why I don't own number three. I really don't, because I really dug this movie, and that's Transpotting. I know I should own it. I really should. Um, I, I think it's a great movie. It's a classic 90s movie, and that along with Requiem for Dream, I feel like that's the ultimate doubleheader movie night, because Transpotting really is such a clever movie. It's very hard to watch with it being about heroin junkies, but at the same time, it's also very funny. 
And I never thought I would say that about a movie because I, when I think of a drug movie, I think of Requiem for a Dream, and that's a uh, down of a movie. But it just goes to show, Transponding, it, it's a really effective movie. I watched this in my filmmaking class, and right after I watched it, I then saw it again and again. I love this movie, man. It's great. I should own it. I don't know why. Maybe I will soon. But that's why number three for me, it's a great movie, Transponding, and that's why it's number three. <coughs> Excuse me, a little water break. Number two. I would say number two is probably the most underrated movie of 2013. I know some people that hate it. I do. I do, at least online. No, not face-to-face. -face. In fact, this is the movie that face-to-face -face I show people, and they're like, oh, wow, that was really good. And I would describe this as Inception, but R-rated and more mature. And that's Trance. First of all, Trance is a very hard movie to find, which is why I'm glad I own it on Blu-ray. Um, this movie really hit me hard. I remember watching this a couple years ago along with Sunshine. And again, Sunshine I only watched because of the score. Uh, Trance I only watched because I had a vague recommendation from someone I knew in high school. But I didn't really think anything of it in high school. And so years later, I decided to watch it. And my goodness, this movie hit me hard, man. This movie is another example of Dutch Angles done well. But this movie, it's easily a film that you could just throw away as saying it's style over substance. And I would say, okay, I can understand where you're coming from. But the style is what brought me to love this movie. It's the story and the messages that really hit me every single time that I watch it. Because the more I watch this, the more I get from it. It's a film that you can watch just as a diverting movie for, you know, the style of Danny Boyle. But it's also a movie that you can watch and really pick apart the messages and the storytelling and say, wow, that is really good. That's something I can relate to. This is a movie that it's trippy. It's very cerebral, in my opinion. It's also very intellectual, I think. I would say definitely watch this movie because I know some people that, you know, after the end of this video, when I say, you know, rank your you know, choices. I can definitely see this being on the lower end for a lot of people, but for me personally, I was able to really relate to this movie and I was able to really say, wow, this is not only a very unique way of going about this premise, but it's also just incredibly well made. I loved it. That's my number two. Number one, number one um, this, this is a movie that it, it, it inspired The Walking Dead. Uh, I didn't like The Walking Dead, but this is a movie that Inspire the Walking Dead, it is a movie that's grown in cult following, and at the end of the day, it is my favorite Danny Boyle movie, and that's 28 Days Later. I know you know 20 Weeks Later, which is, it's a it's a good sequel. I think it would have been better with Danny Boyle's directing, but still good. But we're talking 28 Days Later, um, written by Alex Garland, who does a great job with the writing. Danny Boyle's um, directing is on point. I loved it. This is one of my favorite zombie films, if not my favorite. And I think it's really effective because it has a post-2001 kind of feel to it, which made sense because, I mean, this was a year after 2001, you know, happened, you know, 9-11 and everything. But it's really eerie. Like, it's very hard to watch with a lot of the scenes. It focuses on the characters and it really does make you care for the characters. But it's also a technically well-done movie. I mean, Danny Boyle is very experimental. I mentioned with Trance and yesterday how he does, like, you know, Dutch Angles and even Slumdog Millionaire. But I don't think I've all... Well, I also mentioned Steve Jobs, I should say, with, you know, playing around with cinematography. But this is another example of him playing around with cinematography. Because it's filmed on a camcorder. That's right. A movie in 2002 was filmed on a camcorder. And yes, I own it on Blu-ray, but it does show that it was filmed on a camcorder. But it was artistically done. And I know some people that didn't like that it was filmed on a camcorder, but I think artistically speaking, it really does make it feel as though it's a documentary. And I think that's the best part about this movie. And that's why, yeah, 20 Days Later, it's it's a great movie. Now, what I always like to do, and I know I say this at the end of you know every single one of the ranking lists, so if you've seen many of my ranking lists, I apologize for repeating myself. But what I like to do at the end of each review of you know director's films is, are they a good director? You know, is this is something I would recommend people to do to watch all their movies. And for Danny Boyle, I would say that you can skip some of his movies. Like some of, you know, 9 to 13, I would say you could skip. And although I said some of those were solid to okay, I still think that if you want to get a really good appreciation of Danny Boyle's style, watch um, 1 to 7 specifically. Because I think that Danny Boyle, I feel as though later on in the years, he really did regain his, his style. And I think that although transpotting was one of his earlier works where he fully realized his style. 
I think that from 28 days later to 127 hours, that was when he fully realized it to the point of him being like an Academy Award winning director after Slumdog Millionaire. But he's a great director. I think his movies are worth watching, specifically, again, one to seven. And I love his style of just being able to just be ballsy with each movie that he does. Like each project he treats as it's, it's something completely different. You know, there are some directors where as much as I love Christopher Nolan, a lot of his movies are very similar. But with Danny Boyle's movies, none of the characters are really too similar. They all are dealing with like morals and whatnot, and like some of them deal with family. But it's not the type of thing where one to thirteen, every single one of the characters are dealing with something that are all similar. I like that. I like that each film can be looked at differently because it does show that his style as a director has really grown a lot, and I like that. And that's why Danny Boyle, I say watch his movies. I really would say watch his movies because he's a good filmmaker. And enough of that exposition, though, guys. Let me know your ranking list of Danny Boyle's movies in the comment section below. What do you rank his movies as? From 13 to 1, 1 being his best. Let me know in the comment section below. And who do you think I should do next for directors? I'm thinking honestly of doing like Jason Rettman, um, Sergio Leone, um, Sam Mendes. Directors like that I'm planning to do next. So look out for those. And guys, as always, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget the subscription, notification bell, and I'll catch you guys later.